Okay, folks, we're ready to get started. Thanks for your patience. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Edward Wolcher. I'm the curator of lectures at Town Hall Seattle. And on behalf of Town Hall and our friends at South Seattle Emerald uh, and our hosts here at Rainer Art Center, I'm so happy to welcome you to this evening's series of readings from this fabulous text, Flight of the Assemblies, a collection of some of the my favorite writers in Seattle and their perspective on politics in this moment when we're all kind of in this holding pattern, thinking about what is going to be coming in the political season in a couple of days. Uh, we're really grateful to Marcus Harrison Green, the former, the founder, former editor of Associated Emerald, now at the Seattle Times, for uh, collecting this group of readers tonight that you're about to hear. Uh, I'll let him talk mostly about that, but uh, in this room here, I just want everyone to know this. Uh, thanks for being here. Town Hall uh, is producing events around town for just a couple more months. We'll be reopening early next year. If you are gluttons for punishment, you can come join us on Tuesday night. We are hosting an election viewing party <laughs> up on Capitol Hill at the Summit event space. Uh, there's some other great um, political and social programs in the next couple of months. I'm re really excited about an event that we'll be hosting uh, here in early December with Randy Shaw, a housing advocate from the Bay Area who's done a lot of work around affordable housing and like tenants uh, organizing there in the, like, the different political situation of, of San Francisco and Oakland, spring some of that wisdom up here, something to put on your uh, calendars, all of that is available on our website, townhallseattle.org. Uh, but without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Marcus and uh, the Flight of the Assemblies program tonight. So thank you so much, take it away. Well, good evening to all of you. Thank you for uh, braving uh, the weather and the darkness to come out and be with us tonight. Um, very much appreciative of you all. Um, I just want to say thank you to Town Hall and to Edward for hosting us tonight. Um, and also a, a huge thank you to Vlad Verano, who was really um, the reason that we are here, here today. He was the one who collected the fine works that are in the book, Life and Assemblies. I also want to thank the fine readers that we have today. Um, this is the third time doing something like this, and uh, this is, but it's the first time that we are opening it, it up to not only readings from the book, but also readings um, from our past, uh, and some voices from the past um, who uh, could have been speaking two minutes ago in terms of their, um, in terms of their, their prophecy, if you will, about um, our current day and age. Um, with that being said, I. Uh, Someone asked me today, um, you know, what makes me hopeful about the future, and, uh, and specifically the future of our country. And that was uh, it's a large question because that's something that I've been attempting to uh, answer for myself in these last few years. Um, just to be honest, I'm not necessarily hopeful. I don't, I don't derive hope, I should say, from our past or from our present. Um, it doesn't necessarily satiate my my hunger for hope looking back, uh, looking at right now, what does satiate that hope is uh, the future for what we can be as a nation, for what we must be as a nation. And as my grandfather used to say, um, when I asked him if he was an optimist, he said, uh, of course I'm an optimist, I woke up this morning. <laughs> so all of you thankfully woke up this morning and are here. And um, I, uh, I'm hopeful for tomorrow because of, because of all of you. Um, that being said, uh, let's kind of just go ahead and get into our program today. I am uh, so blessed to be joined uh, by some of the most fabulous readers and writers uh, that the city has on offer. I would say that this nation has on offer, but I, I might be overdoing it, I don't know. Um, so our, our first reader would actually be me, I know him very well. Uh, it's, uh, I'll be reading a reading called A Search for Identity in the Land of the Free. After me will be the multi-talented Sephiriana Day, uh, reading a poem, actually, Dark Testament by Pauline Murray, one of my favorite poems. We will then have uh, Chris Kindle, a wonderful Rainier Beach community member, uh, reading The Kids Are All Right for now. And then we will have the uncomfortable uh, Tyrone Beeson, who is uh, many compared to a uh, modern day James Baldwin. And fortunately enough, he will be reading James Baldwin. A, uh, <laughs> called uh, America's, a reading called America's Beginning. Uh, we will then have uh, the talented Alex Gallo-Brown, poet, Renaissance man, 
reading workers of natural food grocery stores unite, a reading that is in a flight of assemblies that is available at that very table for the low, low price of $14.99, I believe. Um, and then we will finish off uh, with the great Cecilia Hayes reading Freedom Day, by, uh, originally done uh, by Ella Baker. So, um, yeah, I will go ahead and, uh, and start us off here. This uh, reading, A Search for Identity in the Land of the Free, is something that I wrote while I was a columnist at the Seattle Weekly, um, and still could have an opinion before I switched to being an unbiased journalist at my, my current publication. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a year after um, the 2016 election, and when I kind of finally had time to really assess the state of the world, the state of myself, the state of my community, and what I really wanted to do. Um, and it was also sort of a um, autopsy, if you will, um, and, a, and a call out uh, to our country on um, that many times doesn't take the time for, for extended self-reflection. So, so here it is, uh, Search for Identity in the Land of the Free. For the last year, America has been in the throes of increasing internal conflict. But this country has long been suffering from an identity crisis, since just before the ink dried on the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence. Who can claim this nation as a land of opportunity? Who deserves its freedom and liberty? Who is subject to its justice? Whose humanity is affirmed by its laws? Whose voice is amplified? Whose is muted? It's a shame such questions continuously confront a nation so ill-equipped to handle the burden of self-examination. As Alexis Tocqueville long ago pointed out by documenting our infant country, Americans can do simplicity quite well. Grappling with nuance, not so much. This wrinkle plays into our society's preference to view this nation's role as that of an undimmed light in a theater of human history. We'd rather forego any critical collective appraisal of our past hand in reducing our present's harvest of national polarization, deep-seated mistrust of our institutions and each other, and our societal inequities. It's the reason an increasing number of us have little recognition of the America our fellow citizens dwell in. And no, I'm not referencing, referencing the rural enclaves that the media rushed to cover after last year's election. I'm speaking to the psychological terrains of what it means to be a woman, impoverished, a person of color, transgender and elderly in this country. These lies exist near a wavelength along a spectrum still unseen by too many. Much too often we'd rather view a manufactured version of the United States that plays out like a Disney-fied version of the Grimm Brothers fairy tale. Discarded of all of its untidy parts in favor of happy endings carrying the message that no matter what came before, all is well. It's this version of America still holding much of our civic imagination captive, replete with the message that with a bit of grit and hard work, all is attainable, no matter the systemic barriers. The last can be first, the feeble turn dominant, and the powerless transformed into the mighty. It's this America that greets black football players kneeling with confusion, mass protests of police brutality with derision, and rampant reports of sexual assault with dismissiveness, unless it satiates the craving for celebrity news. It's this version of America that persists even after that election which took place one year ago this week, providing a traumatic shock for many, but sadly little vision for a way forward. Those resisting our current administration may offer opposition, but scarce on that menu is a new way of life, our reimagining of the mechanisms guiding this country. Too, too many, Trump comes across as an aberration, not an inevitable reckoning for a society in radical need of reflection and an uprooting of its mythic fable so as to leave a flagrant truth. Instead, we hear that America is a strong nation that will wither the storm. Indeed, ours has been a powerful nation. It has been a wealthy nation. It has sometimes been a generous nation. But has it ever truly been a great nation? It cannot be until we acknowledge the truth of who we are. It cannot be until we actually agree upon exactly what the truth is. It certainly won't be if we continue force-feeding our citizenry a version of America fueled by fantasy over fact and resort to anger whenever one of their fellow citizens can no longer stomach swallowing such fodder and decides to speak out or take a knee. Great nations sacrifice comfort for honesty, 
myths for reality and coerced uniformity for revered variety. No, America is not a great nation, and it was not before Trump, but it can be after him. It first must start with a vision of an America with new values, new principles, a new understanding of our common good, a new meaning of what it is to be American. The American character has been associated with many streets. One we must lift to prominence is an aspirational nature, a pursuit of being better than we are. America will always be scarred by the sins of the past. We cannot forget the genocide that accompanied the country's expansion, the slavery that fed the economy, or the subordination of women that persisted throughout its growth to a global superpower. America can still be great, though. But there is so much we must share. Our current president, our racism, our patriarchy, our structural inequality, our predatory capitalism, our military-industrial military complex, that will happen only if we demand it, every single day of our lives, viewing the present as fertile ground in preparation of the harvest to come for, from our efforts. There's no moral arc in our universe that naturally bends towards justice. There are only hands that drag society by the collar, kicking and screaming into a just and equitable dime. Those hands belong to us. to provide unfiltered truth about and a testimony about the past and the present and the future of the nation that she lived in. Um, as Marcus kind of alluded to earlier, her words, I feel, are very true to where we are today. And this piece is called Dark Testament by Polly Murray. I sing of a new America, separate from all others, yet enlarged and diminished by all others. I am a child of free man and slaves having neither superiors nor inferiors, progeny of all colors, all cultures, all systems, all beliefs. I have been enslaved, yet my spirit has been unbound. I have been cast aside, but I sparkle in the darkness. I have been slain, but I live on the rivers of history. I seek no conquest, no wealth, no power, no revenge. I seek only discovery. Of the illimitable heights and depths of my own being, but love, alas, holds me here, consigned to a sacrificial flame to burn, and find no heart surcease until its most enduring uses I may learn, that teach me. Hope is a crushed stalk between clenched fingers. Hope is a bird's wing broken by a stone. Hope is a word in a tombless ditty, a word whispered with the wind, a dream of 40 acres and a mule, a cabin of one's own and a moment to rest, a name and a place for one's children, and children's children at last. Hope is a song in a weary throat. Give me a song of hope and a world where I can sing it. Give me a song of faith and a people to believe in it. Give me a song of kindliness and a country where I can live it. Give me a song of hope and love and a brown girl's heart to hear it. Wednesday, a palpable gloom thick into the air. I don't know the political leanings of all my co-workers, but it was easy to spot the disheartened or shocked, those disheartened or shocked by the outcome of the election. We shared stories of election day parties that went from cautious optimism to teary wake, 
as the exit poll numbers showed what is now a stark reality, President Trump. Because it was a Wednesday, I was due at the Lake Washington Apartments that evening to work for an hour with one of my students at the youth tutoring program. Many of the kids enrolled at that location are from immigrant or refugee families. Many are of the ethnicities and faiths that Trump has disparaged, criticized, or openly threatened with deportation. Girls and boys who came here with their parents seeking safety and a future. During the 2012 election, I volunteered for the YTP summer session and worked with three preteen boys, two from Somali Muslim families, the third with roots in Central America. We were doing a project about the election, 2012 election, and they asked who I was going to vote for. Curious as to what they would say, I ask, who do you think I would vote for? We were doing, uh, wrote that part already, sorry. Who do you think I would vote for? Romney, they said in unison. What makes you think I'd vote for Romney? There were screwed up smiles and nervousness as each of them tried to figure out how to answer. Because you're white, said one of the boys. You have the same hair, said another, laughing. <laughs> okay, first that hair comment, ouch. But, I laughed along with them and we discussed the candidates, why skin color has no bearing on how you vote. And I'm really going for more of the Jimmy Stewart thing, but whatever. Back to Wednesday night, the day after the 2016 election. The student I work with on Wednesdays takes a specific joy in criticizing Donald Trump, especially his hair. And I fully anticipate he'll have something to say about the election results, but he doesn't bring it up. I don't hear any of the kids talking about it. From what I observed, the children treated it like any other night at the center. So I ask my student, what do you think about the elect? Don't even say his name, he says, cutting me off. Our exchange barely goes beyond that before we're back to homework and fidgety asides about his sporting heroes. At the suggestion of the center supervisor, I read a Huffington Post piece with recommendations on how to talk to children who are anxious about the future now that Trump is in the Oval Office. I haven't had a chance to try any of those ideas yet, perhaps on Monday when I work with my other student who, like many of the kids in the Lake Washington Apartments tutoring program, is a Somali Muslim. He too has a keen awareness of this election. How will I answer him, or any of the other students there, if they ask how a man can rise to the nation's most powerful office with a campaign steeped in xenophobia, misogyny, and fear-mongering? I can't drag my feet and mope. There's plenty of that happening at my day job where the adults feel a sense of freedom to let the aftershock continue. But eventually the topic will come up. Because these kids are curious, they're aware, and they know that the tutoring center is a place where it's okay to ask big questions. This will shape their worldview, and I want that worldview to have more hope than fear. Even if the newly elected leader of our nation won that position, position by using a litany of talking points from a playbook of intolerance. At work, the mood is still grim. I'm part of a team whose reputation and value hangs on creativity, but few are still feeling inspired. Still, there are deadlines to meet and projects to complete. Yet, at the tutoring center, just one day after we chose our new president, it was an oddly typical Wednesday. My student had a productive hour. I was happy for the distraction of algebra and earth science. The inauguration will happen soon after winter break. The other shoe will drop, and President Trump will be sworn into duty. I anticipate questions and comments from the kids at the youth tutoring program, and I'll answer those as best I can, if I can. I don't know what I'll say. What can any of us say? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. James Baldwin happens to be my uh, favorite writer, too, so this is going to be a treat for me. I've never actually had an opportunity to read his work uh, out loud, except outside of my living room when I'm by myself. <laughs> um, in fact, after the election in 2016, that night, the way that I consoled myself was to um, pull his anthology, The Price of the Ticket, from my bookshelf and read some James Baldwin that night, and I read myself to sleep. So uh, I think I'm going to read myself awake with this presentation. But first I want to start with a little appetizer from James Baldwin, who was also a poet, among other things. 
And uh, his, his book of poetry, Jimmy's Blues, is one of my favorite uh, books because there's a lot of wit and a lot of sarcasm and insight in, in these short poems. This one's called Imagination. Imagination creates the situation. And then the situation creates imagination. It may, of course, be the other way around. Columbus was discovered by what he found. <laughs> this speech was from 1963. The, be the beginnings of this country have nothing whatever to do with the myths we've created about it. The country did not come about because a handful of people in Europe said, I want to be free and promptly built a boat or raft and crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Not at all. Not at all. The people who settled the country, the people who came here, came here for one reason. No matter how disguised, they came here because they thought it would be better here than where they were. That's why they came, and that's the only reason that they came. Anybody who was making it in England did not get on the Mayflower. This is important. It's important that one begin to recognize this because part of the dilemma of this country is that it has managed to believe the myths it's created about its own past, which is another way of saying that it entirely denies its past. We did several things in order to conquer the country. There was, at the point we reached these shores, a group of people who had never heard of machines or, as far as I know, of money, and we promptly eliminated them. We killed them. I'm talking about the indigenous people. I'll bet you, as we say in Harlem, that there are not many American children being taught American history who have a real sense of what that collision was like or what we really did, how we really achieved the extermination of the Indians or what that meant. And it's interesting, interesting to consider that there are very few social critics, none to my knowledge, but I say very few, who've begun to analyze the hidden reasons that the cowboy Indian legend is one of the most popular legends in American life, so popular that it still, in 1963, dominates the television screen. And I suppose that all those cowboy Indian stories are designed to reassure us that no crime was committed. We have made a legend out of a massacre. Now slavery, like murder, is one of the oldest human institutions. So we can't quarrel about the fact of slavery. That's to say we could, but that's another story. We have enslaved him because in order to conquer the country, we had to have cheap labor. And the man who is now known as the American Negro, who is one of the oldest of Americans, American citizens, and the only one who never wanted to come here, did the dirty work. He hoed the cotton. Well, the uh, hoe cotton? <laughs> no? Well, they chopped the cotton. Well, whatever they do with cotton, they picked it. They lined track. Helped, in fact, I think it is not too strong for me to say, let me put it this way, without his presence, without that strong back, the American economy, the American nation, would have had a vast amount of trouble creating its capital. If one did not have the captive toting the barge and lifting the veil, as they put it, it would be a very different country, and it would certainly be much poorer. But the people I'm speaking of who settled the country had a fatal flaw. They could recognize a man when they saw one. They knew he wasn't, I mean, well, you could tell. They knew he wasn't anything else but a man. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they came here to establish a free country, the only way to justify the role this child was playing in one's life was to say that he was not a man. Because if he wasn't a man, then no crime had been committed. That lie is the basis of our present trouble. Because that is an extremely complex lie. If, on the one hand, one man cannot avoid recognizing another man, it is also true then, obviously, that the man, the black man, who was in captivity and treated like an animal and told that he was one, knew that he was a man and knew that something was wrong. I prefer to believe that if this society is created by men, it can be remade by men. The price for this transformation is high, 
and every white citizen of this country will have to accept the fact that he is not innocent and that those dogs and those hoses, those crimes are being committed in your name. Thank you. home with my co-worker that did it. We barely knew each other's names, but we worked in the same department. She was upset, and I let her know that I would listen. Her kid was sick. She already had nine points. Her meth head brother was at home, and if she missed even one more day, they would probably let her go. I had been at the job less than a month, but I knew that something was wrong. I got the job as a cook in a natural foods grocery store outside Seattle with the intention of subsidizing my creative writing. But politics, especially in the wake of the election of 2016, were very much on my mind. Fortunately, my new employer appeared to be a force for good. I believed in people, planet, and profits, presumably in equal measure. I prized cultural and racial diversity and strived to reduce waste. It was good to its workers, providing benefits, lifestyle, scheduling, and profit share. It gave back to the community. It didn't take long, however, for a different picture to emerge. On my third week, I was scheduled to work seven days in a row. Lifestyle scheduling then appeared to be more of a suggestion than a hard and fast rule. The manager's style was brusque, top-down, and impersonal, and the benefits were not available for the first three months, which meant that if we called in sick, we accrued attendance, po attendance points at the rate of three for each absence, two every time we missed an hour or more, and one when we arrived more than five minutes late. After we accumulated 10 points for any reason, even a legitimate illness, over the course of six months, we would be fired. If that policy seemed harsh, the reality was even harsher. We could be fired for any reason, even none, at any time. Since Washington is an at-will employment state, employees without union protection serve at the whim of their employer. They can be hired and fired at will. And at the National Foods Grocery Store, despite its progressive pose, we had no union. We were completely under management's control. I was vaguely aware that it was a non-union store before I began, but it, became, it came fully to my attention after union organizers began visiting workers' homes. News of the activity trickled back to management, who responded by posting flyers in the break room in the hallway near the clock where we punched in. They were so sorry the union was harassing us. Under no circumstances were we to give out information to, about our coworkers. They were here to support us during this difficult time. Those flyers made my blood boil. They hadn't asked us whether we wanted to be part of the union or not. They hadn't given us that choice. I'd worked in the union grocery store before, and I knew the benefits that unionization could bring better wages and benefits, a more reasonable attendance policy, representation in the workplace if management gave us a hard time. But there was broader political import too. In a time of the populist authoritarianism of Trump, unions in my mind represented social democracy. They required people to imagine themselves as part of a larger social project in solidarity with people who they, they didn't personally know. It was only a few days later that I spoke with my coworker on the bus. If I'd been on the fence before, I hadn't, but I'd been busy. Those rotisserie chickens weren't going to cook themselves. Her story made up my mind. I was in a more or less comfortable situation, a master's degree, some money in the bank, a supportive partner, and middle class friends. If they let me go, I could always find another job. My coworker situation was different. If she were fired because of attendance, it might have catastrophic consequences for her and her son. I began reaching out to coworkers who I felt that I could trust. I started with the woman who I bonded with in the break room over our shared antipathy to Trump. What do you think about this union stuff? I asked her when no one was around. Let's talk about it later, she whispered, putting her finger to her lips. We exchanged phone numbers and quickly shuffled back to our posts. That night we discovered that our thinking was aligned. The store wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Despite the flowery rhetoric, the working conditions were unjust. It wasn't right that people were encouraged to come into work sick. Not right that workers could be terminated for any reason at any time. Not right that we were being subtly discouraged from joining the union. We decided to reach out to the organizers and see what they had to say. Our first meeting was at a Mexican restaurant not far from the store. The organizers' method was inquisitive. They wanted to know about how our experience had been. 
We told him about the attendance policy and asked if that was something the union could improve. Uh, it was certainly within, in the realm of bargaining, they said, but to win a contract would be a real test. The store, which was part of a larger chain, was notoriously anti-union. Other workers had been fired for doing just the same thing. If we wanted to move forward, we should know that we were putting ourselves at risk. My friend and I were undeterred. We weren't going to work in a grocery store forever, but while we were there, we wanted to do what we could to help things improve. With the organizers, we made calculations. There were somewhere between 150 employees in the store, 100 and 150 employees at the store. To win a union, we would need at least 30% of that number to sign union authorization cards expressing support for an election. In the election, we would need more than 50% to vote yes. So far, we had two. We obviously had a daunting road ahead. I tried to think about how many people I knew well. Well, as a cook, I was largely confined to the kitchen. I couldn't very well cook orders or produce and start chatting people up. My friend had more access to other departments, but still, 76 people. It was difficult to imagine. What else could we do? Slink back to our corners, look the other way. During the next week, I raised the question awkwardly with my coworkers. The walk-in refrigerator became my office. I bantered with people among raw chicken and blocks of cheddar cheese. I started smoking again. When better than to talk to people about the union than when sharing fire and cold? The responses I got were mixed. One common concern was dues. People wanted to make sure they were getting a fair deal. Another was viability. Could we really get enough support? But the most common reaction was fear. They didn't want to upset management. They didn't want to go against the grain. One woman told me that if I didn't like the rules, I should find another job. Over time, we gradually built up some support. At first two, then three, then five people committed. We met up at my house for dinner, went out to a restaurant for drinks. I found the meetings exciting. At the grocery store, we often talked about building teamwork and community, but this was the real thing, genuine communion and solidarity across racial, class, and gender lines. I'm not sure if management knew what we were up to. I suspect they probably did. They couldn't legally prevent us from organizing, but they could make their opinions clear. The CEO came and held an all-store meeting to address worker concern. We're not anti-union, she said. We're non-union. We're comfortable with how we are. Our department manager told a coworker, the day the store goes union is the day I'll quit. During a meeting with the store manager about a promotion, another coworker was asked to describe his feelings about the union. While interrogation or intim intimidation is technically a violation of labor law, in order for an employer to face consequences, the employee has to file a complaint. And my friend who wanted to advance within the company wasn't about to do that. Over the course of my six months working there, I talked to dozens of workers about the union, many of whom expressed support. Getting them to meetings, on the other hand, was another story. They'd tell me that they were going to be there and then not answer their phone. In a way, I couldn't blame them. Spending your day off, normally reserved for partners or kids or parents or friends, coordinating with coworkers to talk about work, it wasn't that bad. They could always find something else. Something else that was almost certainly not union. At a time when union membership is at its lowest level since the Great Depression, about 7% in the private sector and about 40% in the public, job security for most American workers has become a thing of the past. And while unions are often talked about in their relation to inequality, equally important in my mind is the political consciousness that they can instill. The ethic of a union is participation, empowerment, self-determination, and collaborative pride. It is about many different individuals coming together to speak in a collective voice. Is it any wonder that in this era of declining unions, our politics have seen such a rightward shift? When people are expected to blindly defer to their authority or work at work, would it not make sense for them to be attracted to authoritarian government too? As for me, I was eventually let go. I called in sick a few times. I reached the maximum number of points allowed. Whether I was fired for organizing or not, I suppose I'll never know. And the store was called New Seasons. <laughs> wrote this to speak at a meeting in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. This is rather unusual. Aaron Henry said that 
I had had my fling with all the civil rights organizations. Well, my greatest fling has still to be flung because as far as I'm concerned, I was never working for an organization. I have always tried to work for a cause and the cause to me is bigger than any organization, bigger than any group of people and it is the cause of humanity. This cause is the cause that brings us together, the drive of the human spirit for freedom. You know, I always like to think that the very God who gave us life gave us liberty. And if we don't have liberty, it is because somebody else has stood between us and that which God has granted us. And so we have come here tonight to renew our struggle, our struggle for that which we are entitled to by virtue of being children of the Almighty. The right to be men and women, to grow, to develop to the fullest capacity with which he has endowed us. And as I have listened here tonight, my spirit has rolled over a long period of years and I can think of a number of things I would like to say. But if I had anything at all to say tonight, it is to remind us of something that occurred to me, something that came into focus in a conversation on the night that Medgar Evans' body came through Atlanta. A group of people were down at the station among us. We were there for the purpose of identifying with the great tragedy that had occurred in his being shot to death. And after the ceremony, uh, the, the little ceremony in the station, one of the leading civil rights leaders, I won't name any leadership because it's one of those things, you know, and I won't talk about it too much. But this person said, we are in the final stages of the freedom struggle. And I challenge that. We are not in the final stages of the freedom struggle. We are really just beginning. We are just beginning the freedom struggle. Let me tell you why. Because even tomorrow, if every vestige of racial discrimination were wiped out, if all of us became free enough to go down and associate with all the people we wanted to associate, we still are not free. We aren't free until within us we have that deep sense of freedom from a lot of the things we don't even mention in these meetings. And I'm not talking about Negroes. I'm talking about people. People cannot be free until they realize that peace, we can talk about peace, right? Peace is not the absence of war or struggle. It is the presence of justice. People cannot, pardon me, people cannot be free until there is enough work in the land to give everybody a job. Tomorrow, tomorrow if we are able to vote full strength, and we still voted our full strength until we recognize that in this, this country, in a land of great and plenty and great wealth, there are millions of people who go to bed hungry every night. That tomorrow, if we were to call up all the able-bodied men in our country who could do some work, we wouldn't have work for them to do. And unless we see this thing in its larger perspective, unless we realize that certainty we must, we, we must sing, we must have the inspiration of song, the inspiration that comes from songs like this one that was created and demonstrated here tonight, but we must also have the information that comes from lots and lots of study. And we must come to grips with a lot of problems. We must also know that we are in, in the final analysis, the only group that can make you free is yourself. Therefore, we must be free ourselves from all the things that keep us back. So in conclusion, 
Let me quote one of my favorite or, or improvise one of my favorite thoughts in scripture. And it has to do with the whole struggle, I think, because it says, for now we are nearer than when we first started. I forget the exact quote, but let us cast aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. I love to hear us sing. I've heard a lot of singing in my day. I've been part of a lot of singing, but I know, and you must know, that singing alone will not do it for us. And we are going to have to have these freedom schools, and we are going to have to learn a lot of things in them. We are going to have to be concerned about the kinds of education our children are getting in school, and all of this has to be done alone at the same time that we also recognize that our white brothers, the very white brothers in Hattiesburg and in other parts of Mississippi who have kept us in bondage, that they did it because they did not know any better. They have been fooled, and they have been fooled by those who told them the big lie. The big lie was to the effect that they could do what they wanted in Mississippi with the Negro question. And you know what? The rest of the country for a long time tacitly agreed. That is, they didn't do anything about it. And so all of us stand guilty at this moment for having waited so long to lend ourselves to a fight for freedom. Not of Negroes, not of the Negroes of Mississippi, but for the freedom of the American spirit, for the freedom of the human spirit, for freedom. And this is the reason I am here tonight. And this is the reason I think that these young men who have worked and given their bodies in the movement for freedom, they are here not because they want to see something take place just for the fun of it. They are here because they should know, and I think they do know, that the freedom which they seek is a larger freedom that encompasses all humankind. And until that day, we will never turn back. to all of our readers. Thank you so much to Marcus for organizing this. Uh, I just want to say this is a powerful moment to just listen to historical political words, contemporary political words, and think about this last couple of days before the next great shift in American politics and history. Uh, thank you for our Seattle writers and readers tonight. Thank you all. Uh, remember to vote. See you soon.